In the heart of a divided nation, the American Civil War redefined the landscape of military and moral conflict. But beyond the battlefields lies a less told, darker narrative. The grim reality of prisoner of war camps. These camps scattered across the embattled states became the final harrowing chapters for countless soldiers, north and south alike. As the war dragged on, resources dwindled and the humanitarian crisis within these makeshift prisons grew more severe. The conditions faced by captives on both sides were marked by disease, starvation and neglect. The names Andersonville and Elmira come to haunt the collective memory of a nation, symbolizing the brutal cost of a nation at war with itself. In recent years, certain deluded groups of people have openly declared that they think civil war in the United States would be a good idea. The first one claimed 600,000 dead, just under 3% of the total U.S. population at the time, and left hundreds of thousands more maimed and mentally scarred for life. And though we have come a long way, it is still felt today. Luckily, most civil war casualties happened in the country's woods, fields, and hills far away from large cities, or the total would have been much higher. Part of that was circumstance. Part of that was the unwritten rules of war at the time. But the primary strategy of the North would eventually strangle the South had they not been defeated militarily by 1865. That would have meant starvation on a vast scale. Taking the same percentage as a starting point for a second American Civil War would mean just under 8 million people would die. Factoring in the lethality of modern weapons and the willingness of people in the 21st century to blow up civilian buildings and kill civilians en masse, it's not hard to imagine a death toll of more than 10 million people or more. The worst part? Most of the people urging a civil war think they or their loved ones would miraculously survive. Many people in the United States in 1861 felt the same way. Historically, civil wars have been some of the most bloody and brutal affairs in human history. In the Middle Ages, in Europe and Asia, civil wars were usually fought for a king or queen and the person or family trying to take their place. Wars of religion often involved countrymen fighting against each other to determine whose version of God would reign across their land. The Thirty Years' War, fought between 1618 and 1648, was fought mainly in Germany over whether Catholicism or Protestantism would be the religion of the various German-speaking states of the time. Other nations became involved and, in the end, an estimated 8 million people died, most from the disease and hunger caused by the war. The Russian Civil War cost anywhere between 5 and 10 million people's lives. The Chinese Civil War of the 30s and 40s took a similar toll. Historians point out that civil war tends to be more intense and sometimes more costly for some very important reasons. Civil war tends to be the last resort. Negotiations, or politics, break down. After sometimes years of attempting compromise, both parties view the other as a relative who is trying to destroy the family and bring ruin to the country. When civil conflict breaks out, it's usually because of ideological religious differences that go to the core of people's beliefs. Have you ever heard the saying, don't discuss religion or politics at a dinner party or family get-together? There's the reason why. The United States in 1860 was no different. Most Southerners, whether they held slaves or not, believed that slavery was either the way of things or permitted by God, because slavery existed in the Bible. Briefly, most Southerners viewed Northerners as out of touch with how things were in the South, and as trying to economically enslave white Southerners by outlawing slavery, among other things. One of those other things was simply a question of people from hundreds of miles away telling them how they should or should not live their lives and run their economy. Many Southerners also made the claim that the North was trying to limit states' rights. But many people forget one simple thing. The right that Southerners were defending was slavery. Truth be told, slavery was not the biggest issue for a lot of Northerners. Mostly, they cared about keeping the Union strong and unified. However, as the war went on and more and more soldiers were exposed to the horrors of slavery, northern feelings began to change. Of course, there were dedicated abolitionists in many northern states and in the government. They believed slavery was a moral sin and a personal evil, which it was. This and much more turned the Civil War into the most savage and costly war in American history. Prisoners Within a short time, the war went from the relatively amateur affair fought at First Bull Run, where many men believed that once the other side got a taste of war, they would lay down their arms and negotiate. When this didn't happen, the war slowly grew in intensity and feeling. Many people speak about families split in two because of the war, and this is true. But even more accurate is the fact that most of the family members lost 
were on one side or the other, not both. Within a short time, brothers, sons, friends being killed turned many hearts to stone. And when the enemy who may have killed your brother or best friend falls into your hands, brutality happens. The most infamous POW camp of the Civil War was the Confederate camp near Andersonville, Georgia. But there were camps throughout the South, and in some cases, captured Union soldiers faced the same horrors as they did at Andersonville. Two other notorious Southern camps were Camp Florence in South Carolina, in which nearly 3,000 Union POWs died, and Cahaba Prison in Alabama, an old mining operation turned into a POW camp. At both camps, overcrowding, inadequate sanitation and disease, starvation and mistreatment from guards combined with almost no medical care resulted in over 2,500 deaths at Cahaba. Andersonville claimed around 13,000 lives. Malnutrition and disease were the biggest culprits. Andersonville was really just a large fenced area. Some of the first prisoners received tents or shelter halves to protect them from the elements. But there was never enough, and those that were came apart quickly. Prisoners spent most of the time in the elements. In Georgia, especially in summer, this can be brutal in the extreme. The heat of summer, rotting corpses, and men with open sores brought flies and other vermin, which in turn spread even more disease. And if the disease from vermin didn't kill you, well, the water would. Especially towards the end of the war, when feelings had really hardened, water was given only rarely. Most of the prisoners had to rely on the stream that ran through the camp. Unfortunately, that stream was also the camp latrine. Stronger men or new arrivals might fight for a clean drink as the water flowed into the camp. The dead bodies were seldom retrieved, and combined with the flies, maggots, and mosquitoes, they polluted virtually all the water in the camp to one degree or another. As the war went on, rations for the prisoners became smaller and smaller. One hard biscuit with a piece of spoiled bacon might be the most a prisoner got. Some of the most alarming pictures of the war were taken after the liberation of Andersonville. 80 years before the world saw the living skeletons of the Holocaust, Americans were starving each other to death. Victors control the narrative and tell the tale. After reading many books about the Civil War, you might be under the impression that Andersonville was the only POW camp, or that it was only the Confederates who mistreated their prisoners. Unfortunately not. The most famous Union-run POW camp was Camp Douglas near Chicago. And in recent years, the camp has been under great scrutiny by historians. Estimates of the dead in Camp Douglas run between four and 7,000 men, again, mainly through disease and malnutrition, but also through exposure and poor medical facilities. Camp Douglas's last commander instituted the deadline, an imaginary line bordering the camp yard. This meant anyone crossing the deadline would be shot. Some Southern prisoners intentionally walked over the deadline as a form of suicide. Other notorious Union camps were a point lookout prison in Maryland, the site of 4,000 Confederate deaths, and the relatively small but infamous Elmira Prison in New York. Elmira is still a notorious prison in the New York State's prison system, but the death rate per year is measured in single digits. During the war, nearly 3,000 people died or were killed, some by intentional overwork and harsh punishments. When the war ended and the photos of the liberated prisons of Andersonville were seen in newspapers and magazines in the North, howls for justice and retribution were heard throughout the Union. The official name of Andersonville was Camp Sumter, an apparent reference to the war's first battle and a southern victory. The commander of Camp Sumter was a Swiss immigrant, Captain Henry Wirtz, who was put on trial in the fall of 1865 and hung on November 10th. He was accused of stomping a POW to death, chaining POWs together in the elements, setting dogs on prisoners, pistol whipping a prisoner, and ordering guards to fire on POWs randomly. Since Wirtz's trial and execution, there have been reports that the trial was fixed, that the outcome was settled even before it began, as the northern authorities were eager to assuage public anger over the treatment of prisoners at Andersonville. There's no doubt that Wirtz contributed to the misery of the men at Andersonville, though Union prosecutors attempted to blame him for every problem at the camp, including the delivery of supplies to the camp, though that was out of Wirtz's hands, especially at the end of the war when the entire South was on the verge of starvation. As you might imagine, there were a number of investigations of Union soldiers and soldiers guarding Southern POWs at places like Elmira and Camp Douglas, though the vast majority came to nothing. The legacies of these camps, Elmira, Andersonville, and others, should be remembered any time someone thinks a second civil war in the United States might be a good idea. This has been History on Fleek. Thanks for watching.